Okay, um, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit now. Uh, we're going to do examples of both a weighted average cost of capital analysis. We're going to walk through the one that's in the, um, in the valuation template. We're also going to do a uh, DCF analysis. I'm going to do a quick and dirty DCF for Kraft. So I am on the WAC tab of the uh, valuation template. And you should have this exact, these exact numbers on your screen as well. So what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to walk through. I'm going to show how the weighted average cost of capital is calculated for all five of our comps. And then I'm going to show how we calculate the weighted average cost of capital using some of these data selectively for our company A. OK, so for each of our comps in our WAC template, and this is a complete analysis, so we're really just going to walk through and show all the components and explain it to you. Um, we're capturing several different important characteristics. We're capturing, first of all, capital structure. Okay, how much debt, how much equity do each of our comps have? And you'll notice if you put your cursor, if you highlight any of these cells, you'll notice that we're not hard coding any data here. Right? These are all black. This, all this text is black. Rather, we're actually linking to our comp spread tab. We've already captured these. We've spread each of our five comps. We have their debt. We have their preferred. We have their market value of equity. We've calculated their total capitalization or their total enterprise value. All right, so rather than redoing it here, we're, doing, uh, we're linking to data that we've already captured. We're also going to capture uh, debt to equity ratios. Again, when we unlever and relever beta, these are going to be important. This is the indication of each company to the, ex the extent to which it uses leverage. And there's some variability in here. Kraft, obviously, far more heavily levered than Kellogg. We captured debt to total capitalization. Okay, Kellogg being the lowest at 25% debt. They've got 75% equity. Kraft is the highest, 34% debt, 66% equity. These items here add up to 100. All right, as they should. Any questions on that? We'll show you how these come, come into play a little bit later. As we go down this slide, um, now we're capturing a bunch of different items that should look familiar. These are items that are going to be specific to our capital asset pricing model. We obviously need um, a levered beta on each company. You'll notice that these are hard-coded. The reason they're hard-coded is we haven't, we haven't come across this yet. I can't link to anything. All I've done is look, look up beta for each company. And I've used a five-year beta. I, sh I show the source of my data down here below. I think I got my betas from, um, from a research service called Zacks Investment Research. I was able to look, look up those betas. So again, we look up the levered beta. And then to remove the effective leverage, we unlever beta for each of the comparable companies. So Kraft's levered beta is 0.63. When we unlever it, we get to an asset beta or an unlevered beta of 0.47. We do the same for each of our companies. And then we come up with median, a median unlevered beta of 0.46, a mean unlevered beta of 0.42. And that formula that we're using for our unlevered beta should look familiar. Taking our levered beta, divide by 1 plus, 1 minus, the, um, 1 minus the tax rate times the debt to equity ratio. Right? Equity risk premium, this term that we have out here, that's the term in our cap M that we multiply by beta. Again, this is something we've just looked up. And in this case, you'll see that we're linking, we're referencing another cell, cell C57. which is down here, which is also linked to cell AE105. Let's go over and show where that is so you can see what this, how we've set this up. As you scroll down and to the right, and right now I'm in cell, what is it, um, Z99, so kind of over in that direction. We've captured the long-term, intermediate-term, short-term equity risk premium. These came, I got these from Professor DeMotor in sight, but he uses the Ibbotson data and just calculates those. And so we're using the long-term equity risk premium, 6.42%, which, again, feeds into our CAPM model up here. And now that we've got beta, now that we've got 
um, equity risk premium. And now that we've got a risk-free rate, which is also down here, the 20-year Treasury bonds sell C56. As of our valuation date, I looked it up on the Fed website, the 20-year Treasury was 2.89%. So our cost of equity, if we look in column O for Kraft, we're looking in cell O28. We're simply taking the risk-free rate plus their levered beta times the market risk premium. Pretty straightforward. As I mentioned before, we're looking up all those inputs and then doing, doing the math. Now, cost of debt. In the case of the cost of debt, we actually do a little bit of analysis that's based on these companies' debt footnotes in their financial statements. And if you look and sell Q28 for Kraft Foods, their cost of debt is 6%. We're linking to sell AX141. So if we scroll way out to the right and down, going down to that AX41 cell, right, you see we've calculated a cost of debt of 6%. The way we've done that, and we do this for every company the same way, is we're analyzing each individual piece of debt that they have from their debt footnote. And these items that I've highlighted here match their debt footnote exactly. <coughs> So in the case of Kraft, they've got some long-term notes that have due dates through 2039. They've got some Euro notes due through 2015. They've got a 7% bond due in 2011. They've got some other foreign currency obligations. They've got some capital leases and other debt. Where the data are available, we're capturing the following. Capture what is the amount outstanding and what is the interest rate. Based on these amounts outstanding, we calculate what is the percent of their total debt, what is the weighting of their total debt, does each line item represent. We multiply that by that individual debt's interest rate to get a weighted average. Right? And then when we add those up, we've calculated a weighted average cost of debt of 6%. Pretty straightforward. The only caveat here that I'll mention, and I've, I've kind of put some some comments in these cells. Some of these items, even though they were listed in the debt footnote as having an amount associated with them, we didn't capture that amount because they didn't include interest rate information. All right, so for these other currency obligations, it was actually a pretty small amount, but they didn't tell us what the interest rate associated with those was. Same for the capital leases, so we've left them out. We list them. And we show these comments to show we didn't over, overlook it. But because we didn't have enough data to calculate a weighted average interest rate, we've basically excluded them from the analysis. And we do the same thing for every one of our comps. Okay, So if we look at ConAgra, we've basically replicated their debt footnote. For Heinz, same thing. General Mills and Kellogg. And so that cost of debt that we're capturing in our model up above in this column Q, that's where that's come, coming from. All right, now that we've got, we've got cost of equity, we've got cost of debt. Cost of preferred in this case is zero for each company. They don't have any preferred. If they did, it would be noted what the, what the preferred rate of return is on that. On that preferred stock, we'd capture it here. But now that we have cost of debt, cost of equity, we've got the relative weightings in the capital structure up here. We've also got the tax rate. We can multiply them out, calculate a weighted average cost of capital for each company. And that's exactly what we're doing in this formula here. Same formula we showed in the slides. We're just putting it to work here to calculate a WAC for each company. And when we look at all the data, we have weighted average cost of capital ranging from 4% to 6.7. Median of 5.9, mean of 5.6. So it's pretty safe to say for these companies, weighted average cost of capital around 6%. So that's interesting. That's well and good. We know what the WAC is for each company. But the goal is to figure out what is the WAC for company A. We're trying to value company A. Your homework is going to be, a D, is going to, be to do a DCF for company A. So what should it disc, its discount rate be? And this is where we apply the data we've captured above to company A specifically. Okay. Company specific risk premium, I'll come back in a moment. I touched on it during the lecture. I'll show you in a moment how that's taken into account. 
because that's something we can use. All right, and the key information we're going to pull from our comps is going to be twofold. Number one, what is their unlevered beta? We talked about that before. And in this case, we're going to use the median unlevered beta of our comps. We're going to source that from the data we've captured above. Cell K34 is the link. It tells us that the median unlevered beta is 0.46. And what we do from this point is now we need to relever that beta, as I talked about in the slides, to capture the leverage specific to company A. Now again, if you've got a client, you've got access to the CFO, they can tell you our target capital structure is 40% debt, 60% equity, great. You can probably go ahead and use that. All right. But in this case, company A is made up. In other cases, you may not have that information from the company itself. We're going to actually rely on the median values of our comps to tell us what their quote unquote optimal or target capital structure might be. All right, so if we look over here, we capture the mean or the median debt to enterprise, equity enterprise values, and we'll use the median debt to equity ratio basically to calculate, to relever our beta. And that's all this formula is here. Same formula as I showed in the slides, formula for levered beta. So we relever that, we get our levered beta of 0.61. Now we've got everything we need to capture to calculate our capital asset, use our cap M, calculate our cost of equity. And then in this case, we're going to assume for company A, we're just assuming a cost of debt of 6%. All right. Maybe it's higher, whatever it actually is. Ideally, we can get that from the company or from their financials, show us what their actual cost of debt is. Since company A is a made-up company, I'm just picking 6%. Reality, they're a lot smaller. They're probably not going to get 6% debt when Kraft and the other companies are getting 6% debt. They'll probably pay a higher coupon, but is what it is. All right, so we assume a 6% cost of debt. We calculate a cost of equity using our capital asset pricing model, which ends up being 6.8%. And if we calculate a WAC based on that, it gives us 5.9%. Again, company A, made up company, <coughs> private company, a lot smaller than our comps, probably not going to have a, a cost of debt identical to the comps, probably not going to have a cost of equity identical to the comps. And here's where a company specific risk premium can come in handy or can come into play. If we look at our cost of equity formula, we'll see that. <coughs> We're taking our risk-free rate plus beta times the, times the equity risk premium. But then on the end, we're actually adding on a term for the company-specific risk premium. This is where the model can be a little more subjective, a little more flexible. This is also where an analyst or an associate can quote unquote manage the valuation to get the numbers to come out the way they need to. All right. That's actually, you know, it's, it's rare in investment banking that you go into a valuation exercise completely blind. That is, I have no idea where this company is going to be valued when I finish this. But typically what happens, especially if you're getting invited to go pitch to try and win, say, a piece of M&A business, typically the company is going to give some indication of where they expect valuation to come out. It's the investment bank, banking analyst, associate's job to find a way to support those numbers. And a company risk specific risk premium is a way that analyst or an associate can bring down those numbers if DCF is giving a result that's way too high. So if I add, if I go back to my company specific risk premium and I say, all right, my valuation's coming out too high, let's add a 3% premium. That's basically a straight add on to our cost of equity. So it boosts our cost of equity instead of 6.8%, now it's almost 10, it's 9.8%. If we run that through and weight it, it boosts our cost of capital from 5.9 to 7.9, or almost 8%. All right. So that company specific risk premium can be used, again, to account for a number of different factors. Maybe the company's very small. Maybe it's got a key person. Maybe they've got some crazy projection assumptions. But for whatever reason, you know, it should be something that you can support, you can justify. 
it's also you know, something that can be useful in managing valuation numbers down to, a, to an acceptable range. We'll talk about that a little more when we get into pitching in class eight. Talking about how we want to manage our numbers and come in in terms of the pitch. You don't want to come in way too high valuation when you're pitching for business because right? if all the other investment banks are at a certain number and you're way above that or way below that, that can be problematic in terms of winning business. So that's one reason why we might use that. All right, but we'll talk a little more about that later on. Right. If there are no more questions on WAC, what I want to do now is I actually want to build a DCF for Kraft Foods. And if you go to the DCF-Craft example tab, if you go actually in your valuation folder and you open up that shell model, and go to the DCF craft example, you can follow along with me, your numbers are filled in. But similar to the spreading exercise I did in class last week when I spread Heinz, in my model I've taken the numbers out and I'm going to recreate that so you can see the methodology that goes into building not just a DCF but also a stripped down set of projections. All right, so if you just want to follow the um, exercise with the answers filled in, open up your shell model, and I'm going to basically populate my model, and at the end of the day, it should equal what you've got on your screen. Okay, so here's the situation. I'm trying to do a DCF for craft, just for fun. And all I've got at this point, I've got the first two years of forecasts, which I got from the analyst reports. Remember that. We looked at those Credit Suisse reports, pulled the projections. All right, as you can see here in both of these columns, I'm linking to my comp spread tab. If you were to follow that link all the way back, it's just linked to where we spread the analyst forecasts. But like I said earlier, DCF is usually a five year period. So before I can do a DCF, I need to forecast three more years of results. All right, so that's the first thing I need to do. Remember back to the, those four steps of a DCF. I need to do step one. I need to forecast free cash flows. The way I'm going to do that is using some assumptions. I'm going to make some assumptions as to how quickly I think Kraft's revenues are going to grow, what type of profitability or EBIT margins they're going to have, how much depreciation and amortization they should have, what type of capital spending they're going to be doing, and how much they're going to need to invest in their working capital to support that growth. And the place that I'm going to capture those assumptions, if we scroll over to the right into cells Q or into columns Q, R, S, and T, we can scroll down and we can see a list of quote unquote key assumptions. This exercise I'm doing here is very, it's basically identical to what you're going to do in your homework. All right, so I'm going to do it here. You're going to get some ch a chance to replicate it on your DCF homework tab tonight or whenever you get around to doing homework. All right, but here are the, the assumptions that I'm going to use in building these stripped down forecasts. And this will be helpful also tomorrow when we build a full set of projections. Right, the first thing here that we've got listed is something called a stub period. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. That's not going to make sense until we get to the proper time. Uh, but moving down, my assumed valuation date, just like it was when I did my comps and my precedent transactions approach, assumed valuation date is December 19th. My revenue growth for these next three years, I'm assuming Kraft is going to grow revenues about 5% a year. So you'll see that input into the model. This is hard-coded. And as we get into modeling, you'll see that when we put in assumptions, we typically enter them as hard codes. That way we can come back, make a change to our assumptions in one place, and then it'll flow through the rest of our model. All right, so this is hard coded as it should be. I'm going to assume an EBIT margin of about 11%. And these are consistent with what Kraft's done historically. I'm not going way out on a limb and saying they're going to you know, radically increase their profits or grow their revenues at a rate that they haven't achieved in the last few years. So these are based on my having done a little analysis of craft first. 5% revenue growth, 11% margin at the EBIT level. I'm going to assume a 35% tax rate. Uh, depreciation, amortization is a percent of revenue. We're going to assume 2.5%. We're going to assume that they're going to spend 3% of revenue as CapEx. 
and we're going to assume that their working capital as a percentage of their incremental revenue growth is going to be 10%. I'll show you how I use that in a moment. But that'll give me an estimate how much money Kraft needs to invest in working capital. Okay, and then there are some approach, some uh, assumptions down here. Um, let's ignore these for the moment. We'll come back to these when we get into the actual DCF itself. First thing I need to do, though, is I need to fill out my projections. So I'm going to start here in 2010. All right. So year one or 2010. I need to estimate revenues. And again, my assumption is that revenues are going to grow 5%. So what I want to say is equals last year, or F9, times, open parentheses, 1 plus my growth rate. So I say 1 plus, and I'm going to scroll down. And I want to highlight cell Q23, 5% revenue growth. Before I hit enter, though, or before I close that parenthesis, I, I want to do something called locking on the reference. I mean, this isn't a finance term, this is an Excel term, because I'm going to want to copy this formula across. If I don't lock on the reference, that is, set the formula up so that no matter where I copy it in my worksheet, it always refers to this. If I don't lock it, then as I copy it one to the right, it's going to refer to the cell one to the right. And in that cell one to the right, there's text. There's not a growth rate. So the way I want to lock on this is I want to hit F4. And you'll see that when I hit F4, it puts a dollar sign, both in front of the column as well as in front of the row number. And that's how you can tell that the cell is locked. Now I can close my parentheses. And now I can copy this, Control-C to copy. I select the range where I want to paste it, control V to paste. All right. If you're not familiar with Excel, if you're not familiar with the shortcuts, um, starting tomorrow I'm going to start writing these down on the board. So all the little keyboard shortcuts that I use, F4 to lock, control C to copy, control V to paste, I'm going to keep a running tab of these. Uh, but at this point, just kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with the terminology. So I have revenues. Next item I need, and again, these items, I'm, I'm capturing these. I'm forecasting them so I have enough data to calculate free cash flows. I need EBIT. And like I said earlier, my EBIT I'm going to calculate as a margin on my revenues. Every year, it's going to be 11% of revenues. So in each year, what I want to do is say equals revenues. So in 2010 equals, sorry, equals G9 times that margin, Q24. All right, so take 11% of revenues in each year. But again, before I copy this across, I need to lock on Q24. Otherwise, this calculation won't work. So again, to lock F4, and I can copy that to the right. Next item I need, DNA, depreciation and amortization. And as we recall, we're going to calculate this as a percentage of revenue. When we talk about forecasting a little more tomorrow, you can do this based on depreciation schedules. This can be a very complicated calculation sometimes. But here we're going to keep it simple. Simply multiply each year's revenues by that assumption of 2.5%, which is in Q27. Just like before, I want to lock on that. F4, copy that across. Next item I want to calculate is actually EBITDA. You'll notice there was no assumption for EBITDA over here, because there doesn't need to be. If I make an assumption about EBIT and I make an assumption about DNA, I'm calculating the two components of EBITDA, and I just need to add the two together. And actually, if I look at cell F12, which is just to the, to the left, that cell's already taking that calculation into effect or into account. I can actually just copy and paste that across. So rather than retyping the formula in cell G12, I can copy F12 across. Control C to copy, Control V to paste. And you'll see that now we've got EBITDA in the last three years of our model as well. Now, EBITDA is not part of not directly part 
of the free cash flow calculation. Where I'm going to use EBITDA in my DCF is when I calculate that terminal value. Remember, I'm going to calculate terminal value by multiplying year five EBITDA by a multiple. So that's why I've captured EBITDA up above. <laughs> Next item I need, CapEx, capital expenditures. Here's where there's a little bit of a twist. Okay, CapEx is a source or a use of cash. It's a use, right? It's cash that the company, it's an outflow of cash from the company. It's money the company needs to spend every year. Think of it as the company having to write a check. Because it's a use of cash, we want to show it as a negative, as an outflow of cash, similar to how it would be represented on a cash flow statement. So here, instead of saying equals revenues times 3%, I want to say minus revenues times 3%. And the result will be a negative as it should be. Does that make sense? So I want to say minus G9 times, just like before, I'm going to scroll over to column Q, cap, grab my CapEx assumption, which is in Q28. I'm going to lock on that and copy it across. So we list it as a negative for two reasons. One, it's a use of cash. The second reason is when we put it into our free cash flow calculation, if you add a negative, it will automatically subtract it. Right, so it's a little easier in that regard. And then the last item I need, my working capital requirements. And recall earlier when we talked about the assumption for working capital, we said that working capital requirements are going to be 10% of incremental revenues. That is, if we take a look at how much revenues have grown by between this and last year, we would then multiply that difference by our 10%. We're also because it's a working capital requirement, as companies grow, they tend to have to invest in working capital. It's also a use of cash. The cash will be tied up in working capital. We want to reflect that as a negative. So the way I want to phrase this is I want to say minus, open parenthesis, this year's revenue minus last year's. Remember, this is incremental revenue times my working capital percentage at 10%, which is in Q29. I also want to lock on this. And I can copy that across. Don't get too concerned. The reason I want to do this and have you watch, I really just want you to listen to the methodology, listen to some of the shortcuts being thrown around, kind of get familiar. Make sure you understand the concept. You'll get to do this as practice for homework tonight. And then tomorrow, we're going to be very hands-on. We're all going to be working in Excel, building a model. All right. So if you've never done this before, just listen along. If something doesn't make sense conceptually, make sure you ask a question, uh, because we will start doing this tomorrow. At this point, I have everything I need to calculate free cash flows in each year. All right. So I've done step one of my model. I've forecasted. What my, free, what my free cash flows are going to be. Now I need to capture them down here in my DCF, my actual DCF model. Let's take a look at what this model contains just so everybody's on, on the same page. Each year we're going to show what the revenues are, really just to give an illustration of how quickly the company's growing. And then down below we're going to actually calculate free cash flow using the inputs that we just calculated above. So EBIT, less taxes, less CapEx, less our working capital, plus our DNA. Same formula I put up on the board earlier, same formula that's in your slides. All right, so that's something, that's actually a formula just like the enterprise value formula. Commit that to memory. If you go and start interviewing at an investment bank, chances are someone's going to ask you how to calculate free cash flow. It's an integral part to the DCF analysis. You should know that. And actually, the way I've set up this model is I can actually just copy the contents of column F. I can just copy them across. Because if we look at the cells in column F, it's just referring, it's just linked to the numbers up above. And if I just copy those links across, it should give me the numbers that I need. So here I'm going to select all of the numbers in the DCF section, column F, Control-C to copy, 
going to select my range from 2010 through 2012. That's where I want to paste these. I control V to paste. Just a quick and dirty or quick way of, of doing this without having to type in all the formulas. But again, all these cells are doing, they're basically just linked up to the numbers above. With the exception, exception of taxes, taxes are being calculated as a percent of EBITDA using that 30%, 35% tax rate. And if you want to ask the question, where is free cash flow? It's right here. It's right here on this row 34, cells E34 through I34. These are the free cash flows, periods one through five. These are the numbers that I need to discount back to the present. And then I'll add that present value, that resulting present value, to the present value of my terminal value, which I'll do in a moment. Let's talk about year one. Let's talk about 2000, the 2008 numbers before we go on. Okay, if we look at 2008 relative to 2009, see that the numbers are a lot lower. And if you look at the 2008 numbers in our DCF section down below, you compare those to our forecasts up above, they don't match. Who can tell me why? What is different about 2008 compared to 2009 and beyond? Yeah, think back to the valuation date. We're valuing craft as of December 19th, 2008. 12 days before the end of fiscal 2008. Our projections represent a whole year of projections. But if I were to come in as a buyer of Kraft, I bought the whole company as of December 19th, 2008, the only forecast that I get the benefit of is from that period, from December 19th through the end of the year. I only get the benefit of 12 days worth of revenues, 12 days worth of EBITDA, 12 days worth of cash flows. <coughs> and that's what that stub period is intended to represent, the portion of the year that remains. Because in 99.9% .9 of the situations, you're not going to be valuing a company right as of January 1st and have the whole year ahead of you for your first year. Chances are your first year is going to involve a stub period, and so you need to account for that. And the way we've done that, if we go back to our assumptions, now we can explain this calculation. Our stub period basically takes the difference between these dates, the difference between our fiscal year end and our valuation date only in the first year because if we buy them as of December 19th, 2008, we'll get those 12 days of 2008, but then we'll get a whole year of 2009, in 2010, 11, 12. So it's only in this first year, we take the difference between the dates, and Excel has a nice function where you can actually add and subtract dates. So you can take two different dates, subtract them, it will give you 12. We divide that by 365, and the stub period expresses in percentage terms how much of that year is remaining. And once we have that stub period, in this case 3.3%, every line item in our, 12, in our 2008 column for our DCF is multiplied by that 3.3%. So we take revenues, full year revenues times 3.3%. Full year EBIT times 3.3%. And that tells us, that approximates what percentage of those cash flows remain. All right. That's a pretty simplistic assumption in a seasonal business like a retailer. If you buy a retail company on September 30th, 2008, right before the Christmas season, you're probably going to get most of their cash flows. Okay, so if you're doing this with a seasonal business, you'll want to adjust, you'll want to have an understanding of what percentage of cash flows they generate during what portion of the year. In this case of Kraft, we just did a straight up, assume that basically every day gives a certain percentage of cash flows. 12 days comprises 3.3% of the full year. And then for each successive year, it's just the full year number is taken from above, straightforward. And now we get down our free cash flows for each year. Again, are in row 34. Now all that remains is we need to express them in present value terms. That is, we need to discount each cash flow back to the present. 
Remember that time value of money formula we went through before on the board? That's where the time value of money is going to come into play. Right. Let me put the time value of money formula up here just so we've got that as an example. Remember what I said earlier, a present, if we were solving for present value, we take future value, we divide by 1 plus the discount rate raised to the nth power. The future value in time n. Okay, another way of saying this in a DCF context, free cash flow, year n, divided by 1 plus r, whack, raised to the nth power. All right, just our time value of money formula we went through before. The question is, in each year, what is n? The first question, anyway. What is n? In this model, we're actually going to take a simplistic approach. We're going to assume that all cash flows come at the end of each period. So in year one, n would be equal to what? Expressed in terms of per, or the proportion of the year remaining, in year one, it would be equal to the stub period, 0 0.03. Actually, I think it's 0 0.033. Okay, so I'm going to say in year one equals Q20. And then each year beyond that, we're just adding a year to it. So at the end of year 2009, it's 0 0.03 plus a full year. So that'll be 1.03. 1, 1 so we'll just say each year equals the prior period plus 1. And we can copy that across. Now, in reality, companies don't generate all their cash flows on the very last day of the year. Okay, I know that. In general, you know, if you know, in, in banking, a lot of times what you use is something called a mid-period discounting convention, basically assuming that companies generate, on average, their cash flows halfway through the year. All right, so you would probably do that where. You know, this would be instead of 0 0.033, it would be 0 0.01667 or something like that. And then each year thereafter, you'd probably add a half, you'd add a half to that in year one, then a, then one to that in each successive year. Basically, saying Kraft would generate half its cash flows in the first half of the year before June 30th, the other half after June 30th. On balance, they generate their cash flows June 30th of each year midpoint convention. This is just a basic assumption. They're going to generate it all at the end. All right, I don't want to get too into midpoint at this point. I want to try and keep it simple. Now our discount rate, or our discount factor, rather. And the way we're setting up our DCF, it's a derivation of this. The way we calculate a discount factor kind of separates free cash flow from the denominator term. And what we're going to do is multiply each free cash flow by a discount factor. It's the same as saying, instead of this term, we would multiply by 1 divided by 1 plus our rate to the n. The discount factor being this figure here. OK, so we separate these in, in banking. Um, I'm not really sure why. It's just kind of convention. But what we'll do is for each year is we'll say equals 1 divided by 1 plus our discount rate, which we're assuming to be 6%, which we got from our WAC analysis before. 1 plus our discount rate, which I'm locking on, raised to the and you raise some, the way you raise something to an exponential power, shift 6, get that little hat, the little upside down V character, raise to that period, each year's period remaining. And usually this is expressed in terms of four decimal points. So if we expand that out to four decimal points, it's not 1.00, it's 0.9981. So in year one, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply 85 by 0.9981. That'll give us the present value of that 
future free cash flow. We're just taking an interim step here, breaking that free cash flow formula or that present value formula down into two steps. So each year, multiply free cash flow by the discount factor. If we copy that across, you'll see that each year going out, your discount factor is falling. That's because we're raising each year to a higher and higher power. We're giving less weight to cash flows that are further out because they're more uncertain. As we get out into the future, these cash flows become more uncertain. We want to place smaller amounts of value on that. That is, we're accounting, we're capturing the risks associated with that over time, time value of money. And based on this, if we want to say, if we want to answer the question, what is the present value of our free cash flows from years one through five? It's simply the sum of these five numbers. Present value of our net debt-free cash flows. If you select this entire range, cells E37 to I37, you look down here on the little taskbar, or toolbar, whatever you want to call it, gives us a sum, a total value of 10.7 billion. Present value of the free cash flows year one through five. Is everyone with me so far? I know there's a lot of steps in DCF. It might seem like it's kind of confusing, but you go through this a couple times and you'll, you'll get the hang of it. But what did we say earlier? We said that companies don't just go away after five years. So if we multiply 6.9 billion year five EBITDA times nine, 9x multiple, it'll give us a terminal value or a, or a value of the company at the end of year five, we would expect the company to be valued at 62 billion, 62.1. And then if we discount that back to the present, and we're doing that exactly the same way we discounted our cash flows for years one through five, we multiply them each by a discount factor, we do the same thing here, it gives us a present value of our terminal value, 49.1 billion. So what's the value of the company? Well, we showed the present value of our period cash flows, years one through five, 10.7 billion. If we add that to the present value of our terminal value, ends up being about 59 or 58.8 million. The way we typically represent that as bankers is we typically calculate or we typically present this in the form of a data table. Who's used a data table before? Okay. For some people, this is the first time we're going to see that. For others, it's not. All right. What I just did was hit F9 to recalculate. I was in somewhat of a manual mode here. But that $59.8 billion that I mentioned before, that's where we capture it. That is, we think that most likely our terminal multiple is going to be nine times. Our discount rate is going to be 6%. But in reality, we could be off a little. It could vary between 8 and 10. It could vary between 5 and 7. It could vary even a little wider. All right, this interior range here think, kind of summarizes what, we're, what we think is most likely the range of the company. So it could, terminal multiples could actually be between 7 and 11 times, but we think most likely they're going to be between 8 and 10. Discount rate might be between 4 and 8%, but we think most likely it would be between 5 and 7%. And that allows us to speak in terms of a range of values. What we've done as part of our assumptions, we've assumed two different things. We've assumed two different increments for our terminal multiple and for our discount rate. What we're saying here is we, for the purposes of our data table, we're going to vary that terminal, terminal multiple by one times in each direction. So on the high side, it's going to be 1x going to the right, 1x going to the left, reduction to the discount or to the terminal multiple. And we're going to vary our discount rate by 1% in either direction as well. We can tighten this up. That is, we can make assumptions. In other words, instead of saying vary the terminal multiple by 1x going each way, maybe var vary it by 0.5x. Vary the discount rate by 0.5 or 0.005, or half a percent. 
And now we see that we've got a tighter range of terminal multiples and a tighter range of discount rates. Instead of going 4 to 8, we go 5 to 7. Instead of going 7 to 11 times on the terminal multiple, we go 8 to 10. And as a result of that, our range of values, if I hit F9 to recalc, tightens up a little bit. Now my low end, instead of being 52 billion and change, is now 56. My high end has come down to 63.7. It's provided us a tighter range of value for the client. All right. and you would tighten that range as you get more confident in your numbers. You know, maybe at the start it might be a little bit of a looser range until you understand the industry a little bit better and can feel comfortable that the terminal multiples and the discount rates you're using are indeed accurate and representative of what that company would look like from a valuation standpoint. Conceptually, people follow what I've done so far. I'm going to go into the mechanics in a second, how you create the data table. I'm going to change those increments back to what we had before. And let's talk about how a data table is created. So what I want to do is actually delete this out. And I'm going to recreate this from scratch so you can see how, how we set this up. That'll, that'll give you the opportunity for your homework. Now you'll know how to, how to do this yourself. <coughs> Most data tables are set up pretty much identical to this. Along the top row, you're going to specify one component of your model that you want to vary. In a DCF, it's typically a terminal multiple. And down the left column, you'll specify another component that you want to vary, typically a discount rate. Most DCFs tend to be most sensitive to changes in your terminal multiple, changes in your discount rate, because those items have such an overwhelming impact on the overall value. Right? Discount rate plays into every calculation we make in a DCF. Terminal value, as we said, usually comprises a good amount of the company's overall value because year six to infinity is a much longer time period than year one through five. So most DCFs are most sensitive to these items. Most data tables you see relative to DCF sensitize these two against one another. So typically to set up a, a data table, um, it will be set up like this. The skeleton of the data table will be set up like this. But the keystone to any data table is actually going to be in this upper left-hand corner. And if I take away the background coloring of the cell, change it back to white, you see that there's actually a number in that cell. Right? It was colored green, and the font in the cell was green. So it looked like there was nothing there, but there's actually a value there. There actually needs to be a value there. Otherwise, Excel cannot create a data table. And what you need to put in the upper left-hand corner, otherwise your data table will not work, is the value for which you're trying to solve. And that number should look familiar, 59.8 billion. Remember, that was the number that we saw in the middle of our table a moment ago. That was the enterprise value of the company using a nine times terminal multiple and a 6% discount rate, basically using our base case, our quote unquote base case assumptions up above. And if we look at that formula, that formula to calculate that 59.8 billion is just the sum of the present value of our period cash flows plus the present value of our terminal value. It's the value of the company. So in layman's terms, what we're saying to Excel is, I want to set up a data table that solves for the value of the company under 5 by 5 or 25 different scenarios. And again, a data table will allow me to run this model without having to create 25 different actual versions of it. It'll go back and plug all these values in, spit out what the summary, what the result is in total enterprise value terms. Okay, if this is not here, if you're not telling Excel what you're, want, what you're wanting to solve for, you're just going to get errors because Excel is not going to know what to spit out. So that's the most important cell in a data table. It's the keystone of your data table. You need to make sure you, that you populate this correctly. And typically, once you get it populated like this, we usually change the um, cell, the font color, to match the background color of the cell so it, quote unquote, disappears. 
right? The value's still in there. When the client looks at it, there's not some weird number that doesn't have a label associated with it hanging out there in the upper left-hand corner. For formatting purposes, in this case, we change the font color to green and the background to match, so it quote-unquote goes away. Sometimes it'll be white on white, yellow on yellow, green on green, blue on blue, what have you. I'm going to change that back to green. Right? And visually, it's gone away. But still, if you look up in your formula bar here, you still see that there's something there. There's a formula there. It's that formula that we pointed out earlier. Present value of our period cash flows plus present value of the terminal value. It's still there. It's got to be. And once you've set it up, once you've configured your data table to look like this, creating it is actually very easy. What we need to do, the first step at this point, we need to select the entire range of this data table, including the upper left cell. Don't make the mistake of just selecting the interior, these white cells. You've got to select the whole table, including the upper left-hand corner. That, that allows Excel to see what that upper left-hand corner is. It tells it what it's solving for. Otherwise, you're going to get an error. And once that's selected, the way we create a data table, Alt, D for data, T for table, Alt, D, T. And we should get this nice little pop-up box. And what Excel is doing with this pop-up is it's asking where in the model for this row input cell, where in the model do I enter this terminal multiple? That is the items, the assumptions that appear in this row. And where in the model do I input the assumptions that appear in this column, the column input cell? We need to specify to Excel two different cells, one for the row input, one for the column. So once I have that, my row input cell in this case is Q31, which is my nine times terminal multiple. Okay, that range of terminal multiples appears in the row. So I direct it to where the terminal multiple is input into the model. My column input cell, my discount rate, needs to be input where my discount rate appears in the model, M22. When I hit OK, and in this case, when I hit OK and then hit F9 to recalculate, now I get 25 different values, one for each different combination of discount rate and terminal multiple. And again, the interpretation of this model is that under our base case, base case is another way of saying our most likely case, where we believe that the terminal multiple would be nine times, the discount rate will be 6x, under our base case, which usually always sits in the very center of our model, we think the craft is worth $59.8 billion. But again, we think that you know, there could be some room for error. Those terminal multiples may vary a little bit in reality. The discount rates may vary in a little bit. So we think, you know, yes, this is what we think under the base case. but. There might be some room for error. We're very confident that the discount or the, disc, or the net present value of the company will range between 52.5, billion. Our low and our high of the range. Okay, once you create one, it's pretty easy to do again. Really, the only thing you need to, two things you need to make sure you've got the value you're solving for in the upper left corner, and when you select your data table, you're including that upper left corner in the range. And then once we have a value, a base case value. Now we can calculate what is the distribution of value. That is, how much value comes from the five years, the present value of our five, first five years of cash flows, and how much comes from the terminal value. We express that in percentage terms. As I mentioned earlier, terminal value, there's usually an uneven weight associated with it. In this model, it, it encompasses 82.1% of the total value of the company. <coughs> That is, 81% of our present value comes from years 6 and beyond. 18%, 17.9% comes from years 1 through 5. Not unusual, not necessarily wrong. Again, year 6 to infinity is a lot longer period of time than year 1 through 5. But when we think of some of the drawbacks of DCF, so much of that number is riding on those out years. 
that if there was a little change or a little hiccup along the way, either in the company's ability to achieve those operating forecasts or if we were a little bit off in selecting our terminal multiple, the numbers can change radically. Okay, so that's where we say DCF is very sensitive to potentially small changes in, in our key inputs. Okay, and then we also do an implied analysis here. If we take a look at you know, what is that enterprise value, that 59.8 billion as a multiple of our latest 12 months EBITDA, this is kind of a back of the envelope gut check, sanity check. What does that represent as a multiple 9.5 times? What does it represent as a multiple of next year's EBITDA, 0.2x? We can compare those to how the industry is being valued and say, is that reasonable? Is it reasonable to think that craft should be valued as a, at a, at a 9.5 times multiple of latest 12 months EBITDA? Absolutely. By looking at how comps are currently being traded in the market, if our comps, in other words, are all being valued at four to six times EBITDA, we're getting 9.5 times, we might be a little off there. Some of our assumptions might be a little awry. So it's kind of a gut check. Right, and this implied Gordon growth rate, you know, that basically is working backward through the Gordon growth model and saying, how does that terminal value, what does it equate to in terms of a perpetuity growth rate, and is that reasonable? Um, well, like I said before, if we don't have enough data to do a comps or precedent transactions approach, it may have to be a standalone. If we've got good data from our comps, good data from our precedent transaction approaches, then it may just be something we use to sort of corroborate the values we, we calculated from those approaches. Really just every situation's different. A lot of industries are different. A lot of times, like I said, early stage companies in niche markets, there may be no comps. There may be no deals to look at. DCF may be all we have. In those early stage situations though, obviously those early stage companies have a lot of risk. That risk is typically encompassed through a very high discount rate. VC investors, they're not looking to earn 6% on their money, they're looking to earn 40 or 50%. They're looking to earn a lot more because they're taking on tremendous amounts of risk. So discount rates tend to be much, much higher in those early stage situations.